it is my great pleasure to introduce Mark Chan. Uh, where do I start with Mark? Uh, I've known Mark only for a couple of years now, but I feel like I've known him forever. Mark has his, his reputation preceded Mark. Everybody said, Jeff, you got to meet this Mark Chan guy. He is a magician. He is amazing. And I thought everybody was referring to what he did with dentures and what he did in the digital realm uh, in the dental world. And, and I thought, okay, so he's a magician in, in dentistry. Great. Everybody refers to him this. He does some amazing things. And as you already saw from Adam's presentation, what he does in terms of wax ups and digitally truly is magical. Uh, it, it was incredible, but I didn't realize people literally were saying Mark is a magician. Mark is actually incredible what he's done as a magician. I think some of us, if you've tuned into any of our previous lectures, we've seen Mark. But the biggest rabbit Mark pulled out of his hat was last or the beginning of this week uh, when we had Pio speaking. And all of a sudden Pio's uh, modem went down and we had no speaker. Well, Mark uh, said, well, wait a minute, I, I have a talk about 3D printers. Let, let me talk about 3D printers. Uh, and, and he did. It, it was incredible. And, and so, Mark, thank you very much for doing that. But, but truly, I want to talk about what Mark is. Mark is a denturist. And Mark is trained in Toronto at, at George Brown. And he's been doing it for a couple of years. But, but Mark has just embraced the whole digital realm of, of dentistry and, and his aspect of dentistry in, in the denture world. And he is sought after from many different companies who you know, want, want Mark to, to jump on, on their product. But Mark is very selective and, and, you know, has to feel that it is the right product. So I give great credit to what Mark does. Mark has won awards uh, in terms of his design, as, as you saw what he does with the designs. I mean, the freedom, everything that, that I was, I, when I was looking at those cases that, that Adam was showing, truly impressive there, Mark. So, um, but really he, he has great passion for what he does. I think we're up in for some exciting stuff to listen to with Mark's presentation. Uh, definitely, I hope you show us a, a magic trick maybe to open things up, Mark, but uh, fantastic having you here. Thank you for speaking on the Dentistry Academy platform. Sweet, thank you. Uh, just wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, so, uh, I'm just making sure my sound's on. I'm gonna share my screen now. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear, Mark. Perfect, I'm just gonna do my slideshow here. Um, there we go. All right, guys, I know everyone's here to talk about digital dentures, and I just want to say a big thank you to all my colleagues on the panel here, uh, Hisham, Dr. Sumner, Adam McCabe, and all my friends I met at the Dentistry Academy. But more importantly, I want to thank everyone that's in the audience, because without you guys in the audience, it's impossible for me to do this kind of lecture in this sort of time. And I kind of just wanted to give back to my industry and give back to the young dentists that are in the room. So for my class that's in the room, uh, George Brown, 2009, thank you so much. And for my other denturists in the room, that are watching today. I appreciate your support. And uh, it starts like this, you know, Digital Dentures Foundations 101. For my denturist friends in the room, there's gonna be a lot of basics in the beginning. I know everybody's going to the Digital Dentures 101, the digital side, I will get there. But for the dentist here, let's talk basics. Um, Mark Chan and friends. So a lot of these cases are from my friends throughout Canada. I have the pleasure of traveling throughout Canada and talking to my fellow Canadian denturist. And like Azim Sheikh said in the beginning, it's your relationship with a denturist is also very important in this time and age, especially post COVID. And we're going back to the future. Why do I say that? Because suddenly dentures are cool again. We were the dirty profession. We were the ugly denture kids in the back. And unfortunately in the dental tech uh, way, we were not as cool as a ceramist. but suddenly dentures are sexy. Dentures are cool and suddenly we're back in style. But let's get back to basics. What are the basics? What do we need to succeed? Before we get to digital, we need to talk about data. And what is the data we obtain as clinicians? The data that we obtain as clinicians is our impression. And why do you like dentures? Like as a denturist, I love dentures. But when we ask dentists why, or do you do dentures? They always say, nah, it's too hard. It's too, uh, it's too hard to charge. I don't make any money. And why do we find dentures so hard as dentists? Is it because we only did uh, one course during school at University of Toronto um, and we hated that class? or we skipped that class and we got our dental technician friend to do that denture for us? Did we care? We still passed. Is that the only denture you've done as a junior dentist out there in young dentist land? Have you ever done a denture before? Do you even know the process of denture making? So before we get to digital dentures and software and all that cool stuff and scanning, we gotta know our foundations because we have to get to the end with the beginning. 
So what is the data? The data that we have to capture. The data that we have to capture is the preliminary impression. For those in denture land, we all know this is our alginate impression. And if you didn't pay attention in anatomy class, or if you're like me and you fell asleep, or you didn't have your Tim Hortons coffee uh, before denture class, then you probably fell asleep in anatomy class. And these are basic anatomy that you need to know for denture construction. And it's not all of the anatomy, but I tried to compile this to make sure that you have all the major anatomy to have a stable standard denture for my clinicians that are dentists out there. This also applies to full mouth reconstruction because yes, you only need a ridge, but the more data you can obtain for your dental technician and denturist, and if you are a denturist just starting in digital, you do need to obtain all of these landmarks. And they can start from the retromolar pads, the tuberosities, the lingual sulcus, the frenums, and the posterior border. These are critical to denture retention. This is not implant-based dentures. This is just purely upper and lower removable dentures. I know this is just a review for you guys, but this is foundations. What is the alginate that I'm using? For my dentist friends out there, do you delegate this task to your assistant? Does your assistant know how to make dentures? Unfortunately, I've talked to many dental assistants and dental hygienists. Quite frankly, they don't know how to make dentures. So if you don't know the end story, if you don't know the end goal, and you don't have the picture in mind, how is it possible that you have the beginning in mind? How do you obtain all the data that is required for the end? And as you can see by here, is it the perfect algebra impression? No, like Adam said, um, dentistry is not perfect, but we do have all the major landmarks, the rush from molar pad, the tuberosity, the posterior extension of the algebra. And I bring up this point, why am I saying algebra? Because we all know what algebra is. It's easy, we all know how to mix it. Yes, it can be easy, but if you don't know how to use it, and it can also be a disaster too. So I'm trying to avoid your denture disasters. This alginate I'll talk about in a moment, but what is, are we trying to create from the alginate? So, um, Galano or so, uh, I just got your name wrong, man. Again, Giuliano, there we go, I got it, buddy. Giuliano has uh, thankfully given me these photos to use, and I just wanted to bring up an important topic because we all practice differently as denturists. Um, the way we make our custom trays, are all different. There's over 75 ways to make a custom tray. Is one better than the other? No. There's also many different ways to make a denture. And I'm gonna say today is the way that is the best. It is the way that I make dentures and my team makes dentures. And I just want to show you what all my friends do in Canada, how they make dentures. And if you're a dentist watching this today, um, these are guidelines that you can apply and apply to your toolbox. So what is the border of the denture and why was it so important to capture that border? Um, because you need to mark that border because you are gonna make a custom tray. I know some dentists out there would make a final denture on this object. For myself, my specialty is dentures. And as a denturist, I only make dentures. So I try to obtain the best data possible so that I have the best denture possible at the end. This also applies to digital dentures because this data will be converted into a digital format. And so we capture and make the preliminary model. And the same applies for implant dentures. Adam just spoke about uh, the attachment. How do you make a custom tray for an implant-based denture? Yes, you can place a whole bunch of implants. Yes, you can do fix. But in the case of this, which is a four locator denture, lingual extensions need to be extended because part of the denture is sitting on tissue. And if you don't obtain this data, then the denture will not be stable and the denture will tilt. And therefore, the implants that were supposed to be there to retain the denture will be affected and wear out prematurely. So you must take this into account in planning your case with your surgeon. And that's why it's really important to have a surgeon on board. And also, as Ian said, to have a communicative one level communication. Not one higher, not one lower, but we're all on the same level because we're all on the same team. For myself, what is the impression tray I use? Uh, as a dentist, it's really, really hard to stock a whole bunch of things. And I like to use things for other purposes. So for myself, uh, especially in this time of COVID, when we go back, I don't want to load my autoclave with a whole bunch of trays. So I've opted out to use uh, disposable trays. Um, so they come in small, medium, large. The brand that I'm using uh, is Transform Thermoplastic Trays. I use these because, yes, they match most of my patients. And in the case where the case is too big, I can just dip this in warm water and bend the tray out. And so I can have the most of my clients without having to find a metal tray that can adjust. For my implant guys, it's plastic. So if you need to do an open tray, you can take your low speed handpiece and grind holes in it and you can have an open tray for a fix. So like uh, my team that works with the Zine Shake, uh, my friend Andrew Coleman, yeah, you can use this too uh, for implant impressions. But the most important part about plastic trays, and this is the most important part for my dentures friends out there, don't skimp out on the alginate adhesive. 
Yes, algin adhesive. You have to use adhesive on these types of trays because then the algin can peel out, therefore deforming your preliminary impression and therefore deforming your data. And deformed data doesn't make a good digital denture. Uh, the other purpose for this and why I bring this up in the dentist is that you can also use this for PBS impressions for crown and bridge. Dual purpose, alginate and also PBS. So one tray in stock, that's disposable, doesn't need to be autoclaved, and you can use it for alginate and also PBS. Uh, if you have any questions, just leave them in the chat. I'm going to try to go through this as fast as possible because my time is limited and I need to get to the end. And for my such and denture friends out there, uh, Marcus Fisher, Eric Colbank, and my friends on the West Coast in Vancouver. Uh, if you guys don't know what these trays are, uh, reach out to Marcus Fisher. And this is for the suction denture technique, mandibular suction effective dentures. So for my uh, prosthodontists that are in the audience watching, uh, if you want more information to take the most badass lower impression uh, and also produce a denture that has low retention, uh, that is a tray on the left-hand side to produce that so it doesn't crush the retromolar pad. Um, so just reach out to Marcus Fisher. He's in the chat room. Message them privately. And on the right hand side, this is how we take a preliminary centric for dentures. Preliminary centric is, in essence, a mush bite. If you're a young dentist and you don't know what that is, it's basically to take the edentulous ridges and they bite down into a predetermined centric position. This is not the exact centric, uh, but it allows your technician and dental team, and if you're a denturist, allows you to mount your centric bearing device or gothic arch tracer. For my dentists that don't have such an expensive device from Ivoclar, you can use your um, triple tray, anterior triple tray, and load a little bit of putty in the anterior and get the patient to bite down gently, and you will have a preliminary centric. So this is my little hack for uh, my denturist friends that don't have a centric tray, and then you can get the scanning when we get there. Alginates. I know this is boring for my denturist friends, but this is an important topic for my denturist friends that are in digital. Uh, in the chat below, just say if you're a denturist, a dentist, or if you're a technician, and if you have digital, so I can gauge my lecture towards you guys. On the left-hand side, I use the KVX Cream Alginate. I mostly use Facet uh, for my suction denture kids, or if you're doing dual impression alginates, which is a light body, heavy body wash, um, I use the KVX Normal Set. Uh, if you are a dentist and you have a novice teeth, uh, on the right-hand side is the Tropoline alginate from Zermac. It is a color change alginate. Yes, it's really important to follow setting times for alginate because you can pull and tear your impression again before I mean your data. And this color changing alginate allows your subsidiary team, like a hygienist or an assistant, to know when the material is set at the right time because we are all in a rush and most of us don't have time for a timer. That's weird. And the left hand side for my adventurous friends that have scanners or, or three shape or exocad or in lab, uh, this is a scannable alginate. That means you don't have to spray it. Um, so uh, for those who are digital and understand what that means, and we know the value of a no spray impression material, on the left hand side, it's the only available alginate on the market that is scannable. And it's also replication of five micron. It's the closest alginate I found that can replicate the closest to PBS without tearing. And this is my detail uh, for my partial impressions. This is from my friend Ruben. Uh, Rubim Yusuf in uh, Calgary, Alberta, a good friend of mine that trained at Georgetown College with me. Uh, these are his cases and these impressions. And again, foundations, if you're making a partial denture, and if you're a young dentist just starting with partial dentures, yes, you do need to have lingual extensions. Yes, you need to take a proper margin because you're probably going to make a lingual bar on that. Uh, these are my master uh, impressions for partial denture making. And you need to have a lingual extension so they can make proper saddles. So you can't underextend your borders, even on a partial denture. And for myself, like I said before, this is a scannable alginate, so I can digitize this impression. And this is why I choose to use alginate. Again, one material for partial denture impressions and also for preliminary cut impressions and also for diagnostics for if you're an orthodontist. So move on. <clears throat> And uh, just a quick point here for my dentist friends out there, uh, for most of my dentist friends, we all hand mix. Uh, myself, in my practice, I use a spinning bowl from Tadco, an alginator. Uh, you can also use a mechanical mixing device called the Turbomax from Dent Supply Serona. It allows you to produce a very homogeneous mix of alginates, and I prefer this uh, so I don't have to cross-contaminate my bowls. Uh, that's just a quick point. Final impressions. So we did a preliminary impression to take the preliminary data, and now we have to make detailed impressions so we can have detailed data to produce a digital denture. Final impressions, they are the little things that matter. So we did macro, we did big impression. Now we have to do the tiny impression or the detailed impression, the final impression, the final data. And for our final impression protocol, 
for my dentures friends out there in denture land, you guys all know this, for my dentist friends that have never done a denture or did not pay attention to denture class, these are key points to do a really nice, uh, not perfect, but a really nice protocol for uh, final impressions. So we've got a border mold, so that can be a heavy body or compound like we learned in school. And then we have a corrective wash. That's a light body wash. Um, a light body wash this is a dual impression technique. So if you learned in the school, no, you're not doing the wash impression with a mono face. That's for a one impression, one step technique. You have a tray material, heavy body, and then a corrective material, a wash material. Uh, therefore providing you with the borders and then an overall wash impression. Uh, so for those who are border molding and are new to border molding, uh, this is from my suction denture friends. This is just a little key point. It's not perfect. If you want more information, again, it's not the lecture for this. You just go like this. So if you produce the borders for the maxilla, you go ooh, you go e, and that produces your border. And then you get them to suck your finger. I ask them to suck my finger like it's a lollipop, and then you, you produce a nice border alternate impression. And then for the lower, uh, same thing. You go ooh, e, and then you get them to stick out their tongue and the floor of the mouth. Uh, will raise up when you ask them to swallow. Uh, so this is the same protocol you can do for full X impressions. So for my implant guys, the more data, the better. I know everyone skips out on those impressions, but we need that data to produce what we need to produce, and we're producing custom trays. And like I said before, uh, you can use a spacer. For myself, I use digital to produce my custom trays. This is a wax spacer to produce impressions like such. Uh, my friend, Mr. G, thanks for producing these photos for me. These are on Instagram, you can follow them on Instagram. And this is what I said before, on the left-hand side is a um, thermoplastic border molding compound with a heavy body wash. Uh, he produced the spacer, so it is not overextended, and then he does an overall uh, extra light body wash. For my dentist friends in the audience, if you're looking for a scannable PPS, Harrius Kulzer carries a heavy body, light body wash material that is scannable. This is also for my denturist friends that are doing digital, so you don't have to spray those as well. Uh, you also have a scannable, scannable less or no spray uh, PDS from Maxell. So guys that are taking notes in the audience, you can use Maxell, which is a little cheaper, or the Harrius Culzer Fast and Scan PDS material is the scannable PDS material that's available on the market. And then another topic, because uh, Adam just talked about locators and the CM watch, you know, different roads. This is a heavy bodied uh, order molded impression uh, with a corrective light body wash. And this one's from Zermac. And what are we trying to obtain? We are trying to obtain these major landmarks so we can produce a digital denture. If you don't obtain all these data, there's no way you can make a digital denture without that data. It's not as easy as flicking off a bottle of uh, bubble guys. Uh, you have to obtain that data. And like I said, that data then gets converted into a digital format. On the left hand side is three shape. There are many three shape lecturers uh, in the panel here listening. So if you want more information on three shapes and those protocols, this is not the lecture for today. It's just the basic 101 digital denture basics. But you basically take your impression, your data, and you digitize it. And on the left-hand side, it's the digitized version of that impression on the right-hand side. So like I said before, if you cannot obtain that data, you can't digitize that data. Therefore, you can't make a digital denture. Yes, border molding matters because if your border doesn't exist, where do you mark your digital denture border? So land area. I know a lot of us don't box in four, um, but these are beautiful bottles by my friend Rubim, and they matter because those are your extensions for the borders of your denture. And that is where you draw the margin for your digital denture. And if you don't capture it, you can't make it. Again, different road, same kind of case. This is also the same kind of situation where you have to produce pass mesh or internal mesh framework. So you need to produce a good foundation. Okay, guys, we're gonna slow down just a little bit. I think we're pretty good time and 50 minutes in. Um, all important bite registration. Let me talk about this for, for a second. For my dentist friends out there who never take a bite record for dentures, there's three major tools you can use. In school, in dental school, you use bite blocks for uh, mandible uh, manipulation. That's, that's what we all learn in school. For myself in denture class, in uh, denture school, uh, I prefer Gothic arch tracing. No, it's not a church Gothic arch, it is a gothic arch device. Uh, I'm going to explain that in a second. And then you can also use an existing denture for centric and uh, bite registration, obviously condi uh, condition depending. Uh, for my Winnipegger friends that are out there, it's called the Winnipegger. And if you're a denturist in Winnipeg, then you know what that is. And if you're a dentist that doesn't know this technique, I'll brief briefly go through it. But this is the important part, guys. This is the part that dentists always mess up. This is the part that I always tell the lab to make it work. No, the lab can't make that work. It is your job as a dentist, denturist, clinician 
to get the centric registration to get the pipe. Take your time, take your time, do it right, do it once so you don't have a remake and you don't piss your labs off because labs do not like remakes. Okay, let's go through bite blocks. Bite blocks must be contoured. Yes, the lab made it to 2218. Yes, these are averages, but we are not averages. Human beings are not averages, and this is the same for digital dentists too. And so if you don't know how to contour a bite block with a rim former as a dentist, hell, if you don't even know what a rim former is, and that's gibberish to you as a dentist, then maybe you should take a look on the school of Google and take a look what a rim former does. Yes, you do have to melt this wax. You do have to obtain the plane of occlusion. You do have to do some work. It does not come perfect from the lab. So you have to do some work. It can be messy. It's clinician dependent. And like I said before, it's not one size fits all. You know, you can't just put that and expect it to work. You have to do your job. You do have to do some work. And it is clinically driven. So you can make a mistake and that clinical error can translate to the lab. And also it's uh, iOS compatible. What does that mean? It means that you can use your intraoral scanner, Trios, PrimeScan, Medit i500. It's just a camera, guys. You can scan whatever is in front of that camera, some better than others, but you can scan a bike block. 360 degrees. There have been many lectures by my free shape friends on how to do this with your Creo scanner and my prime scan friends too. There's not time for that, but you can scan not intraorally with an intraoral scanner. And these are the major uh, facial landmarks you need to do uh, ala of the nose, uh, high lip line, midline, plane of occlusion. So for you dentists out there that are taking basics, plane of occlusion, midline, corner of the nose. Mark it on your bike block. That's pretty good for a dental technician to do their magic. And yes, we are magicians, like Dr. Sumner said, because we get you out of trouble when you guys are in trouble. And you know we're behind the scenes, but we don't care because we know that there's a patient at the end of the line. Gothic arch tracer. <clears throat> a Gothic arch device is basically like a D programmer. And for you COIS guys out there that know what a COIS D programmer is, uh, this is similar to uh, what that is, except for e dentulous arches. It's technique sensitive. It takes some time, it takes some practice. It's not perfect, you can make mistakes, but it is patient driven. For those who know what a D programmer does, you have to get them into a repeatable position. Um, and this is the same. And sometimes it takes a week and sometimes it takes a long time for dentate patients. Can you imagine what it's like for a patient without teeth that have been without teeth for 40 years? How do you D programmer a patient or D program a patient TMJ that's been wearing a collapsed denture for 40 years in 10 minutes? Sometimes it happens right away, Sometimes it doesn't, you need to take time. And time is something we all don't have. But if you don't take the time now to take a bite registration correctly, it will bite you in the ass, whether it be a digital denture or a regular denture, and it's vertically dimension dependent. For my uh, ganathometer friends, for my BPS friends, I am also BPS trained, uh, the ganathometer M is quite a large pin tracer. I don't like it because I have to crank the vertical up. Yes, you can use therapeutic dentures. Um, you can use their existing denture to bump up the vertical but that's not my preference. And uh, it is, again, iOS compatible. You can scan it and collect the data with an intraoral scanner. This is a basic, basic central bearing device. Um, I'm just gonna use my annotation uh, laser pointer. And this is a striking plate. And basically, I'm not gonna, if you go on YouTube and you look up uh, Gothic Arch Tracer, you can see a video on how this works. But basically, the patient will trace on this metal plate a, a Gothic arch or an arrow. And at the apex of an arrow is where this striking plate will hit, and that is where you lock it into the centric position. This is patient driven. This is not the time to do this kind of lecture, so I will move on. And you can use their existing denture as center. So for my dentist friends just starting, if they have an old denture that's in relatively good condition, you can do border molding on the existing denture, like a custom tray, and do a wash, corrective wash, and then you can send that lab for mounting, or you can mount it yourself in your practice. And it gives you the midline, the plane of occlusion, and, um, it gives you all the basic data you need for prosthetic construction. However, it is condition dependent. If they've been wearing that denture for 40 years, that's incorrect data. And again, like I said, correct data is the foundation for digital dentures. And this is basically a duplicated denture, but it's an existing denture that we did wash impressions. This is my prosthodontist that I work with in London, Jason Bartolizzi, for again, a CM lock case, uh, just to give you an example, but you can do this with existing dentures as well. Important, keynote. The lab can't make it work. No, you should work with your lab. Don't make them work if they can't do it. The bite registration is the clinician's job. Do it and do it well. Because for us as a lab, bite registration is a piece of silicone 
that puts two arches together. That's what we know as a bite, as a lat. For a clinician, that is the position where teeth go together. And just take that into mind. Yes, we all study from Coyce, Dawson, Spears. They all have concept of occlusion. But to keep it simple for the young dentists in the room, it's where the teeth go together. And if in a DE dentalist arch, there are no teeth. So some of those concepts don't apply. It's where the teeth, our artificial teeth will go together when you set the denture. This also applies for full mouth rehab validations because if you understand the concepts of bite registration for edentulous and edentulism, then the same concepts can apply for full arch restoration, whether it be full arch count and bridge or a single unit dentistry as well. Model analysis. Um, so I'm gonna be moving a little bit faster now so we can get to the design part. We're 30 minutes in. Model analysis for my denture friends, tuberosities, incisive papilla, uh, crest of the ridge, these are all things that we all know in an analog world. These are all in our softwares. So in 3Shape, in Densify Serona's in-lab software, in ExoCAD, this model analysis concept is transferred to our digital denture software. And if we don't understand what these lines do and what they come from, then there's no way we can actually set the digital denture correctly because we don't know what those lines mean. To us, they're just lines. And they're really cool, and they have really cool colors. But that doesn't mean that they have a foundation. They have a foundation in where the teeth go and how they function and where they it's a guideline or a blueprint or a map for the destination at hand and if you don't know how to read the map how can you get there you're perpetually lost forever and so uh two different clinicians same goal a denture that's stable and set up in the analog way so you got your post down you got your midline you got your incisive papilla you got your tuberosity you got your two-thirds of retromolar pad um and you have to mouth it and this is where digital changes because this mounting on a Strauss articulator is virtually done in 3Shape, is virtually done in Serona in lab, and is virtually done in our softwares in ExoCAD. Uh, but you still need to understand the concept and plane of occlusion and why this is and where it is because in a digital world, you cannot physically touch this articulator. It's just on a screen, a 2D image. So you need to have a mental image of mind and how does this empty space appear on a table? in the patient's mouth, because it is a physical object you're producing from a two-dimensional world and three-dimensional screen that is uh, design software. The setup, I'm just going to briefly go through this quickly for my dentist friends. I know you've probably never set up a denture in your life or you've done one and you never want to do one ever again. But just to review, uh, these are my teeth that I use that I love. These are the Vita Panic Cell. Uh, so Denise LaRoque, if you're in the audience, thank you so much for these teeth. I've got the pleasure of testing these teeth. Um, and occlusion concepts. Yes, you can set them in lingualized occlusion, uh, basic centric, uh, working and balancing. These are unique to these Vita teeth, and these are the Vita physiodents. I do a centric key to save my data. Obviously, if you did this digitally, this data is already saved, and we'll touch on that topic in a moment. Occlusion key, anterior six. This is your aesthetic zone. And if you're doing aesthetic veneer dentistry, this is the critical zone for denture work, too, because you don't want too much white, you don't want too much pink. And you know sometimes pink is okay if they have a high lip line, but how do you manage the pink and white aesthetics? And that's how I that's why contouring a bite block is so important, and obtaining facial data for digital dentures is so important. And I do my lower anterior six, and then I do my posteriors, and those are lines coming into into play now. Um, center of the ridge for basics for my denture friends, and then uh, centric. Centric is that position that you obtain with those bite blocks. If you've messed that up. If you screwed it up, you're screwed. It doesn't matter how good you set up these denture teeth, your initial registration, the laboratory can't fix that. They can't make it work. And this is the most frustrating part for the lab because they know it's wrong and uh, you as a clinician don't know if it's wrong. And it's a lot of back and forth. And this is why it's important to have a denturist on your team, guys, because we as denturists really understand this concept. Uh, like Mian said, uh, reach out in this time as a young dentist to your denturist community. And as a denturist, as a young denturist, if there's young denturist in the audience, Reach out to young GPs because they are looking, they need help, and we all need to help each other in this time. And this is working and balancing. Do I believe in working and balancing? To a point, because as a technician, this is my bread and butter, and this is what I know and I'm trained to do. But when a patient puts a bolus of food in their mouth, does working and balancing really matter? Like Adam said, a denture is a denture. And for me, like Adam, I still believe in implant treatment modalities. Yes, you can have a pretty stable denture, and mandibular suction denture technique definitely teaches this. Um, but there is going to be food floating around. But as much as you can stabilize the denture with your occlusion concepts, then definitely try to focus on that. So these are my contacts. And these are my lingualized occlusion point contacts. 
23 points of contact if you're counting points. And as you can see from my dentures friends, uh, if you're still doing analog dentures and this is a review, I try not to flood this with a whole bunch of wax because I'm trying to do a wax up that looks like this. Okay guys, this is an important point. Do all my wax ups look like this? No, this is a selling tool for myself to cross the Donis and to other GPs. And obviously this is what I use my social media for because this looks great on social media. But this is also a selling tool for my, my patients because a lot of us that are denturists out there will always get that patient that asks us, will my denture be that red? Is it gonna be that bright red wax? Uh, when I start, show this kind of case to my patient and I try this in, my patient doesn't say, is it going to be red? They always ask me, are my gums going to look like that? And I say, if you want it to. Yeah, not all my dentures are gingerly toned and not done with composite. But if you don't give the patient a chance to see it, they don't even know what the journey is in mind. But sometimes they know you don't know you can do it. This applies for digital as well, because you can also make dentures sexy again. Let's talk new school. So we talk digital. What are we trying to digitalize in the digital world? What are digital dentures? It's trendy, it's cool. Your neighbor's doing it, your friend's doing it. My friend bought a mill, my friend bought a printer. Do I need to do it for my practice? These are all questions you need to ask. Um, am I too old to get into this digital denture? This is another question I ask. I'm 31, I'm still a young denturist, and I know digital is gonna, gonna be part of my life, so I have no choice but to learn it. Um, so what is new? What are we trying to digitize? What is digital about digital dentures? We are trying to digitize that clinical data that we obtain as dentists and denturists. And we're trying to make it into a format that we can manipulate. That is the data that we obtain, which is the impressions, the models, the bite registration, which is all important and I spent time focusing on, and the facial data, that's photography. So speaking to my friend that's a dentist, uh, digital smile design or DSD is very popular. Can you integrate DSD in your software? Of course you can. Do you have to buy DSD to integrate that? No, you can use Keynote and Photoshop and all those lovely things that are not from dental and integrate that into a digital world too. And you can use that as patient-driven data to produce a final prosthetic that is digital based on analog data that has been digitized. And final prosthetic data. So for the analog guys, why should I do digital? Well, for me as a denturist, when you make traditional dentures, the problem is, is that you damage the master model in final process. You lose that data. It's not saved. So if you have to restart the case in 10 years or in five years, or if something's broken, like Adam mentioned, uh, mentioned in his lecture, it's impossible for you to, to do it again unless you start all over again. You have to take a new impression. And that's the part that takes the most time, that you spent the most time in the first time. So why not save that data in, in, in the computer? And it is something that we all talk about as digital guys in the digital world is data preservation. We preserve the data that a clinician has worked so hard to obtain in our computers so that if we have to do it again, we can do it again and we don't forget. Because I'm forgetful. I have some timers. And quite frankly, I don't remember all my patients, but a computer can remember. Let's scan it. Okay, this is getting confusing now because if you're not following along and you're new to digital, and if you're my denturist friends in the audience watching right now, um, there's so many. There's a new scanner every day. It's the latest. It's the greatest. It's the best. It's the fastest. It's the newest. What is the right one for you? Now, let's break it down into the laboratory because I'm a lab guy. Laboratory scanners come in both open and closed formats. Uh, open scanners are STL export. If you don't know what an STL is, uh, it's stereolithography or STL export is the major common file used within a digital format. And some scanners that can produce this kind of Lovely uh, file is the DOF, a degree of freedom from DOF, the Medit T500, and the Shining. Um, those are kind of an example of open source uh, scanners. Some are cheaper and some are better. Uh, for example, Panthera Dental has tested the Medit T500 scanner, and it's on par. And they're surprised that it's so accurate for implant bars. And I trust Panthera as a company because they're an industrial company. For the closed scanners, very popular for the denturist market. And if you look on social media now and on my other lecturing friends, 3Shape is the forefront runner for denture making or digital denture making right now, but it is a closed or Apple based product. So, in the sense that you buy their scan, you buy their software. Uh, and Serona InLab, which I'll be showing right after this, is also a closed source uh, in the sense that it's closed within its architecture, but it can export an open file. It's important to understand. And for the doctors in the audience that are listening to me, uh, I know you guys know all about the Prime Scan. To Jeff Sumner and me and lecture on this topic for Densply Serona. Uh, I am not sponsored today. I'm lecturing as a denturist. So um, there are open scanners out there too. The Medit i500 
and CareStream 3600 are examples of this. My friend at Emerald Dental Arts, Mark Rosart, he is one of the geniuses that can support you in this time and explain to you what the Medit i500 can do. So reach out, my contacts for them will be at the end of my lecture. And then for my dentist friends, PrimeScan, Trios, and Itero, which one do I get? Which one is the best? I don't know. The point is, is you only you know what you're practicing or what you're creating in your office. Are you an orthodontist? Are you doing single tooth dentistry? Are you doing full arch dentistry? These are all questions you have to ask yourself as a clinician so that you can make an informed decision before you buy. Because look, this is, this is all that I just talked about in picture format. And your sales rep has no idea the difference or what they do. They just, goal is to sell you something. And then you as a clinician have to use that tool. You have to buy the right tools so you can produce the right restorations and as a dentist to produce the right digital dentist. And you export the file as STL, DCM, SEI, DXD. I hate computers, guys. I went to dentism to make dentures with my hands. Now I'm so knee deep shit in digital and computers, I learned a new language. And if you don't know what this language means, it's time to learn because we have time. And then when we go back to work, we're gonna be busy again and we'll be no time to learn. So like Jeff said in his other lecture, time to learn. Time to get started, time to get your feet wet, and time to evolve. Are you confused yet? I sure am. Did I just speak Chinese? Probably. Don't be. The point is, is where is your data going? Where is that SPL going? Let's make something with that data. That's a whole bunch of gibberish I just said. So for the guys that are following along, the software that we need to do is the CAD, CAD Assisted Design. This is how you take that data that we obtained in the clinic and produce a denture. Uh, for the denturists that are watching here, the major denture softwares that are available on the market are FreeShape, ExoCAD, and Serona InLab. These are the ones that are, are very popular for us, and these are very popular for the dental labs that do your restorative as well. Uh, FreeShape being the forerunner for uh, digital denture design. Uh, today I'm gonna be doing InLab, but that doesn't mean it's the best, it's just the tool I prefer. Because you choose the tool that suits the way you work. We all work in different ways, we all have different budgetary constraints, and money does play a factor in these tools because some of us can't afford this uh, at some times and some are more expensive than other. And for those who just are getting started, I know Adam talked about Avidence and for my dentist friends out there, this might be a good place to start because you don't want to buy lab software. So Avidence is a design and manufacturing software which is cloud-based, which means you don't have to buy any software but you do have to pay for subscription fee like Netflix. And you can design your dentures online on the cloud and you don't have to pay for a software to have in-house. Uh, And that's something very, very interesting for me as a dentist or, or you as a dentist or denturist that are just starting the digital denture uh, workflow. All right, let's show you designs. It's demo time. So give me a second as I switch my screen. If you have any questions, just type in the comments below and uh, I'll get to it. So I'm gonna stop sharing and share my other screen. So hello guys. Oh my gosh, we lost some people. I gotta go faster, so one second. All right. So, I don't know if anyone, uh, Hisham, can we see that screen? Are we good? Is that okay? You're good to go. go. All right, so this is that pin tracer that we showed earlier, and this is the data that we created. So this is Serona InLab. Uh, I scanned it with my laboratory scanner. You could also scan it as a clinician with your intraoral scanner, and we need to make a model. So we move on, and we virtually articulate the case. So this is a virtual articulation. Like I said before, we are digitizing that data. And this is the same for three shape. You have to scan your models in or you take an intraoral scan. My friend Carson Law is in the audience. You can ask her about three shape later on. And you draw the denture base. And like I said before, the foundations are important because you need to mark the border. And if you did not obtain that with border molding, there's no way you can mark that border because it doesn't exist. Uh, block out angle is your path of insertion, how your denture will insert. And this little button in the corner is the model analysis. Like I said before, those lines matter because if you don't know what those lines mean, I mean, the software makes it easy for you so you can actually see what it does. So it's kind of like, if you forgot the cliff notes, it's there. But the point of the matter, you need to know where you're going and you need to obtain that data. And let's bring in an important topic up here for digital dentures. How are you producing these dentures? For my denturist friends out there, there's only two ways to, two ways to produce dentures at this moment in time if you do digital. That's milling and that's printing. Uh, milling and printing are very two different manufacturing uh, processes at the end. Uh, being milling is the most strongest produced material at the time. Uh, I, printing is definitely getting better, uh, but I 
right, myself right now, I'm using printing for triants and also for immediate dentures, uh, being the materials that our Health Canada approved. Uh, for final restorations, I still prefer milled. Uh, myself and my team at Adam McCabe's, uh, we outsource the design to a milling center like Avident or a local lab. Uh, for those who have the PM7 mill that are three shape users, then you can in-house in mill these restorations yourself, which is quite a heavy uh, investment, but you need to know how you're doing. So you do your setup. You do your setup here, and I'm gonna blow through this real quick. And this is your initial proposal. Yes, is it gonna be perfect every single time? No, and this is where uh, dentists will get lost with digital dentures because you need to know how to set up teeth. And this is why I talked about setting up teeth first. Anterior six first, then the lower six, then the posteriors, and then you position them in the right place on those lines that I talked about earlier. And then once that proposal is happy, once your setup is done, uh, you propose the denture base, and this is your wax up. And like I said before, if you didn't know how to do a wax up as a denturist, or you were just really messy, then you're going to do a really messy digital wax up. And that's horrible for processing. It's also horrible for manufacturing. And you have to design for your manufacturing process. What does that mean? Well, printing can print undercuts. Milling can't sometimes mill undercuts. So take that into account. Don't go crazy and don't go uh, make a bunch of undercuts in this restoration. And we're going to produce this denture, uh, the final restoration, just to show you. It's going to do its proposal. This is where our computer matters. Yes, also your computer matters, guys. So if you're doing into digital, you do have to have a good computer. I'm running three uh, softwares at the same time right now, three screens. So it's a high likelihood that the software could crash. Plus, I'm running Zoom. Um, so wish me luck. We produced the final restoration here, the final proposal. And then you're going to have four files, uh, actually, six files. You're going to have the tooth arch, and you're going to have the base, and then you're going to have the try-in. So if you wanted to do a try-in, it's a monolithic one-color try-in, and that's the, the one that Adam said. And this is where we work out our phonetics function, our prototype, our let's take it home denture to try it out for a little bit. And that's where we work out our occlusion, because to be honest, these are monolithic or in some cases uh, quite expensive to mill and produce. So you want to do all the occlusal adjustments at the prototype stage because it's very cheap to produce that printed trine. It is not very cheap to mill the case. So this is the arch form for my setup, which can be milled and or printed. This is the upper, and this is the uh, upper base. I know there's going to be some questions in the audience. So can you produce a monolithic uh, case? In the case of this software, no. In the case of 3Shape, yes, you can produce a monolithic one puck uh, restoration. Adam is in the audience, he works for Eric Kapuchka, that's the iVotion puck. Uh, for myself, for my monolithic restorations, I send them to Avident for milling because I don't own my mill myself. And then for a try-in, this is the try-in upper. As I said before, it's not a two-piece. It is a one-piece, and this can be printed. Uh, as Christopher Northup said, I use the Sega Max UV, which is a very fast uh, printer that I have in my laboratory. And so this is how I produce my try-in. So again, we have a lower, upper try-in, and we export the STL, the all-important STL. This then gets sent to your mill, or your lab that has a mill, or your printer, or your printer that, your laboratory that has a, a, a printer as well. So for those who have attended the Carbon, uh, Lucitone Carbon 199 uh, webinar, this is how you send your STL file to a carbon-based lab. I'm just gonna close this real quick, um, and I'm gonna show you another design. Other uses for digital. Uh, are like this. So this is another use for the in-lab software, cast mesh. I just took that denture that I digitally designed, and because it's just data, I made it invisible. And as you can see here, I made a mesh framework for a locator-based denture. Um, so yes, you can work with your analog cast partial lab, and you can produce restorations and help your digital analog lab. So this is a cast partial. And as you can see here, this is a cast partial frame that I've designed internally uh, based on my setup. Therefore, you don't have posts in the wrong place. And then, therefore, this is printed and sent to my analog casting lab and casted. Or I can send it off to a 3D printing metal printer, and they can print the partial for me. So that's one per, uh, another use for digital is to see through your setups. Another thing you can do is you can collaborate with your dentist. I'm showing in lab today because 
Um, the point of the matter is, this is a case from my friend in the US and uh, Dr. Ben Ross. He was practicing on his prime scan and he said, so I didn't, there was no box here guys. I'm doing denture cases for my uh, dentists in other countries and also in uh, across the border. And so this is a copy denture I made for him because he had an existing Panthera bar denture, yes, tying into Andreas's talk, but the patient wanted a temporary. And so uh, he came in with just the denture, no master model. So he 360 he scanned the denture, 360 degrees. And uh, with the software, I produced a model, which is the reverse of the denture. And then I produced the duplicate denture like this. And then I sent this file back to my doctor in the US and he sent it to his lab to mill in the PMMA. So now my, his patient has a long-term temporary they can put in any time. And he didn't take any PDF compression. He just did one scan. And look at how much data I have. You have the occlusion, the aesthetics, the function, and then also the vertical dimension. So you have to restart the case. It's not a problem. And the last thing I'm gonna share here, um, so we did three, is we did a try-in. Um, we did a cast partial framework, and we also did collaborative duplicate dentures. So in a short amount of time, time we have right now, 45, so we have 15 minutes. Let's keep going here. I uh, just need to close this, sorry guys. I have a lot of screen, just give me a second, Not a lot of jumping, sorry. Sorry, guys. And one second. All right, guys, you can give me 30 seconds here. I'm just bringing it back up. I got to close all my slides. I'm going to crash my computer. Sorry. Give me one second. Bear with me, guys. Sorry. All right, here we go. All right, share my screen. All right, we're back. So here we go. We're just going back to my slide that what was using. We are back here. We are almost there, guys. Bear with me. All right, here we go. Let's do some addition and subtraction. That was a lot of things. We just did the design. We didn't talk about manufacturing. So once you have your setup, your data, your STL data from your software, your CAD software, whether it be 3 shape ExoCAD, or InLab, you need to take that file and you need to manufacture it. No, you can't boil it out because there's no wax. No, you can't do an analog way because that is not an analog denture now. This is the digital denture. So your process for the end has to be a digital process. And those two processes, as I said, is additive technology and subtractive technology. Additive being printing and subtractive being milling. I'm not here to talk about mills today. Um, there are many mills on the market. That's another day, another topic. But those are the two basics. For myself, I use the Asiga Max UV. The only reason why I use this is because I can produce many things in my printer, not just denters. For my clinicians, I do digital wax ups or digital try ins. For my cast partial lab, I do cast partials that they can test. Uh, temporary crown and bridge for my dentists that are doing chair side dentistry. For my denturist, you can do custom trays or implant custom trays. And then for my orthodontist, you can do clear aligners. So same printer. And then for my dental technicians that are watching, if you guys are watching, and Leon and all the guys, if you do pressable ceramics, you can press lithium disilicate in the lab. So many uses, one printer and small footprint. It's open. As the materials progress in digital dentures and in printing technology, your printer also has to evolve, which means it needs to be future proof. So for myself, open technologies are my uh, go-to, and that's what I'm always looking for as a digital denturist. So for example, Health Canada, MDAL, M-D-A-L-L, -L, is where you can find all Health Canada certifications. Uh, that is not biased because it's done by Health Canada. And I just wanna talk, uh, briefly wrap up here, because we have 15 minutes, we're going to one. Um, what do I use for digital? I use a combination of analog and digital, like I said. I'm not a fully digital denturist. I know some of my friends, on the Vancouver side are fully digital. For myself, I'm a little bit of old school, a little bit of new school. Um, I was born in that area. I, I love eight track tapes and cassette tapes, but at the same time, I love my Netflix. And if you don't know what an eight track tape is, well, you're a millennial, what are you gonna do? So am I. And so we go here and this is how I remake a case now. So this is a locator or CM lock style denture. And as you can see, the case is kind of falling apart here. It's cracking due to a fusel load. Um, so I actually printed the temporary to hold this vertical and actually sent this to a lab to mill after that. So we had a long-term temporary. 
So I don't have stress because the biggest thing for me is I hate stress and I don't want to rush to repair. So when I rush to repair, things goes wrong. Things go wrong. And I don't like rushing, especially on big screw retained prosthetics. And so we can do tweaks. This is not a denture I made. Uh, this is an immediate denture made by uh, another lab and she wanted some changes. So I wanted to, I was still first exploring digital dentures. And as I said before, you need to start slow. Don't think tomorrow you're gonna buy a software and be able to produce digital dentures. It's not that easy. It took me three years and a break from my clinical practice to learn digital. I knew nothing three years ago. And I took in Doug Deep, uh, big thanks to my lab that I used to work for, Select Dental Lab in Woodbridge, Ontario. Chris, thanks so much for letting me learn. Uh, without him and that team there, I would not be able to show what I'm showing you today. Uh, so we do a digital try-in, and this was done with InLab uh, 19. Uh, you can do this with Serona, you can do this with ExoCAD, and you can do it with ReShape. It doesn't matter on the software, it's a digital try-in. And after that, you produce the case. This is still a work in tow post-COVID. Uh, and like I said before, cast partials. Yes, you can use your printer, and you can send the pattern off to a cast partial lab. And this is a combination. This is a combination of digital and analog, because this is a 3D printed cast partial, and the saddles are done in analog traditional acrylic. And like I said before, yes, you can scan for a cast partial with an intraoral scanner. And that's a question I'm gonna get asked after this, I'm sure. But the problem is, is how to produce a partial after that? Carson Law showed this in a three sheet lecture yesterday, and you can produce saddles if you have a mill. Um, but if you don't, you still have to produce the denture uh, analog on the saddle side. So it's better to pour up a model and digitize it so you have a model to process on. And this is how I collaborate with my dentist. And this is why it's important to collaborate with a denturist that has the technology. And to give you a, a fill-in, guys, uh, there's a lot of denturists in the room right now watching. And a lot of my denturist friends in the room that are watching are also digital ready. So it's time to collaborate because if you want to do cases like this or future do digital cases in your dentistry, you need to reach out to your team. This is an analog denture that Adam uh, was going to show, but we didn't have no time. And I just digitized it. So could I have designed this digitally? Of course. But I also can set up dentures quite fast. You need to remember that you have two hands. And the hand that's controlling your mouse is also controlling your wax up. So if you know how to do a wax up faster than you knew how to do design, then sometimes just digitize your analog work. And now you have a prototype to try in. Just to fill you in on this case, guys, this was a, a all in four case that was not doing so well uh, with my prosthodontist that I work with. Uh, and then we wanted to test if she could wear a locator style denture. Uh, we ran this in the mouse for a week. And basically the patient said, no, I don't like it. Uh, so I gave my doctor same file and I pre produced and printed a clear denture. If you do this the analog way, this is many hours of work because I just don't have time. I just did two runs on my printer on the same file. And now it gives you a chance for your surgeon to place another implant to fix that AP spread. So this is not an, also an educational tool. This is a selling tool and a convenience tool because I digitized my denture. I digitalized my analog work. And then as Adam said, you can rapid prototype this case, place it in the mouth. And like I said before, the patient did not like this. They wanted to go back to fix. So what did I do? I just took that wax up, shrunk it down. This is the same case. And we cut it back. If you don't know what a cutback is, uh, you can do this on software too. But at the time, it was very, very new to digital. And I know how to take a burr and grind it back. And we took this design and sent it to Atlantis at Densply Serona, which is another printing milling center. And Thera also has the capabilities to do this copy mill procedure. But this is printed titanium, guys. This is the next level. This is printed titanium, so no longer milling. Now you can print any shape, any texture, and it's a combination of milling and printing technology together with a little bit of analog, but a lot of digital. So the point of the matter is now we can print textures and shapes, and we're not limited by the limitations. We have the advantages of printing and also the advantages of uh, milling as well. And in this combination, we have an open engineered arch because of the AP spread situation, I just don't want it to break. I don't want the framework to break like we saw Adam showed. They can break, titanium can break. Uh, so we over-engineered it and I scanned the final restoration. Always my analog work is scanned in my scanner. So I save the vertical dimension and I save the aesthetic. So that's just in case in the future I have to remake this case, I can mill or print a temporary easily and give it to my patient and work on this case as a rebase with no stress. All on maybe. So we're wrapping this up now. We have 10 minutes left. Uh, so this was a fixed case. It was supposed to be all in five, all in four. Um, but mid-treatment, uh, this is a bite registration not taken by me. Um, so we need to communicate with the doctor that maybe this bite registration is not right. So we did a digital try-in, which is just 
copied from my analog. You could do this digitally now uh, with any software. And this is Crossbyte. Notice Crossbyte's not right. So in the final restoration, we fixed that Crossbyte restoration to a class one. And so we need to communicate to that doctor that that's wrong or incorrect, or can you check that? And with a wax trying, like Adam said, if that patient bites down, the occlusion is gone, the wax up is gone, your data is gone. So a wax up was not harmed in this try in. And actually, mid treatment, uh, she went from a fixed case to a removable case. And otherwise, what do you do? You take another fixture level impression for, uh, for abutment level for locators? Nope, I just save the data and make custom trays. And this is the case we showed. And we went from a screw retained prosthetic back to removable without taking another bite registration. I know this is a concept hard to wrap your head around. The young dentist you might be losing some of you. I'm sorry. And we took a final impression wash, poured it up. And this is an analog case, but you could have digitized it and set it off to your mill, printer, or milling center. Uh, and this is the case. This is basically copy and paste dentistry, a concept that we know in, in uh, steric. You know, copy or biocopy. On my left-hand side is the biocopy. On my right-hand side is the final restoration or the denture. And like Adam said, we prefer to pick it up in the mill. For my lab friends that are very technical and lab heavy, yeah, you can process in the lab, no problem. You can mill it. Uh, and so we wrap this lecture off with the main points of digital and why I choose to use digital dentures. Do I do digital dentures for all my cases? No. Do I do digital dentures for my cases where it's a tool that I need to use? Yes. Um, it is a tool in your toolbox, guys. It is trendy, but it is a tool that's not leaving us. It allows you to gauge space. It allows you to communicate with your lab team. It allows you to communicate with your surgeon, and it allows you to communicate with your manufacturer, like Andreas from Panthera. See, in this case, it's the Panthera bar, but my setup was not thick enough. This can communicate to my lab team and says, hey, we need to make this thicker. If I make it thicker, aesthetically, it might be comp compromised. Prosthetically, the material is compromised. So it is a communicative tool. We all have cell phones. It's very easy to take a screenshot and send it to my clinician or laboratory team and say, what's the deal here? Can we fix this? Do we have to do something different? Aesthetics. Because it's digital, we can save it, we can tweak it, and you can take a burr and adjust it without fear that I damaged my setup. No problem. You can adjust it, adjust the occlusion, and it's a $2 trying to print on your printer. I just want to bring up a final point because everyone says to me, Mark, is it possible to print dentures now? Yes, it is possible to print dentures now. This is a printed immediate denture we did in two days, actually one day, um, because this patient was in panic mode, teeth were hurting. Um, so you could interoral scan the case with existing dentition, virtually extract the teeth, and then produce a denture in the two-stage format that I showed you. Um, and we printed it on our Seagam Max UV with Zenka Cronenbridge material, shade A1, and we used Dreve denture based for both Health Canada approved. Is this denture going to last the test of time? No. But do I want this denture to last the test of time because it is immediate? No, I don't. I want this patient to come back and come back to me for a final restoration and hopefully some implants. So we need to use the technology in the time and where it is right. It is not a one size fit all. It is not a one trick pony. You need to use the tools correctly so you can produce a restoration like this. Normally, I would have not been able to produce this denture for this patient in such a short amount of time. And um, the patient's really happy. I just called him uh, during COVID, and he, it's, a, it's a little bit loose. He needs a reline, um, but actually he needs a new denture. So when he comes back, we have a patient ready to go, and he will come back to us. And to bring it in all cumulation, to bring out our topics for the dentists that are still in the audience, for the guys who stayed with me, thank you so much. This is a cumulation of everything now. Material science, printing and milling, and the final restoration. So like Adam said, pectin, if you have a mill, you can make your dentures so much more. This is Vita Anamic chair-side material milled on the MCXL chair-side mill to replace my denture teeth. It is a hybrid ceramic, and this can be strong. It can bond to acrylic. And it is a chair-side material, but I'm using for denture teeth, something that doesn't exist, and I can mill any shape, any format, and any thickness because it's designed for veneers. So in a tight space situation, why not use a veneering material? That's what it's for. You're just veneering a denture. And yes, this is just a locator denture. But you can make just a denture way more sexy, and you can up your treatment modality if you have digital technology. Yes, we started from a denture trying, and we digitized our data that we spent so much time to do. But we made it sexy, and we provided a restoration that is a little bit better, a lot better, in materials that my competition can't use because my competition doesn't understand. 
So as a denturist, you need to understand the new materials that are on the market. You need to understand the technologies that are available to you. If you don't have them, time to do some homework and find technologies that suit the way you work uh, and also suit the way that your clinicians work. And then you can do cases like this, which is the case that Adam showed. Is it perfect? Definitely not. Um, but you can produce really awesome aesthetics. Uh, this is the final case that's in the mouth. Um, I just want to say thank you to all my friends. This is such a weird time, guys, uh, as an insurance. I haven't been in practice since March 8th. It's so weird not to see my patients and my friends at conventions. I don't think I'm going to be able to see my friends at conventions. So I just want to say a really big thank you to all my denturist friends behind the scenes that have allowed me to do this work, to share these cases with you, to share some knowledge from my profession as a denturist. Uh, it's not just about me, guys. It's about uh, us as dentistry sharing back to each other. For the first time, I think after this, we need to talk more, we need to collaborate more, and I think we can do uh, really awesome restorations, both analog and digital. Um, so that's all I got for my time. If you want to take a screenshot of that, uh, reach me out on Facebook. Uh, at Adam McCabe Denture is our Instagram handle. Um, and I just want to say my last slide here is, um, oh, I don't have it. Oh, that's it. Hisham, we're done. Thank you so much for that, Mark. That's why he's the best in the business, ladies and gentlemen. And I think everybody's mind was absolutely blown with you transitioning between, you know, three different platforms live. You know, a lot of people can barely hang on to one and you did it three different times. So, you know, hats off to you, bravo, and uh, yeah, man, it's, it's very, very impressive as always. Uh, we're going to bring Andrew in here too to ask some Q&A, but before we go ahead and do so, just a couple of quick housekeeping items again while we have everyone here still. Two new talks have been uploaded to the dtacademy.ca website. One of them is nearly at capacity, and that is the one on uh, labor and accounting law. You're burning, uh, you're burning questions answered, so please, if you're interested in that, make sure you sign up for that right away. Once again, all of our videos are going to be posted on our YouTube channel, so please make sure you subscribe to Dentistry Academy on YouTube. Also, please be feel, feel free to, um, to share and like these videos and also follow us on Instagram and on LinkedIn. Tomorrow, May 14th at 11 a.m., we have Jason Adenata, who's going to be talking to us about hype dentistry, followed by the one and only Dr. Gordon Shi, who will be talking to us about setting the path to sensational smiles. And then we'll be finishing out the week with Dr. Nada al who will be talking to us about treatment planning, the worn dentition, and that will be on Friday, May 15th at 12 p.m. And then we have the labor and accounting talk. That will be at 3 p.m. this upcoming Friday as well. So I would like to introduce our good friend, Andrew Hogan Khan, who will be asking Mark some questions. So thanks to both speakers, both amazing talks. Um, very well explained. We do have four questions here for you, Mark. Sweet. So the first is from Carson, and they're wondering uh, when you're using the pin tracer, if you yep. get a very sharp point, but also get a very consistent tapping point, uh, mm -hmm. you're not in the same spot where yep. do you attach your plastic verification hole um so both carson carson is my friend from uh the northern lights dentry clinic so if you guys want to know anything about intro oil scanning full art carson lot is your girl you can reach her out at the, the northern lights dentry clinic on facebook uh the tapping point so i'm not uh trained on the suction dentry technique and that gothic arch tracer technique uh when you do a pin tracer uh, for myself, uh, initially when I trained with the Gothic Arch Tracer, uh, I was trained to put it at the apex point of the pin tracer Gothic Arch, which is the triangle point. Um, uh, when I attended uh, and listened to Dr. Abbey lecture, the tapping point is a point that may be slightly forward of the centric position. Um, so to be honest, and I don't want to step and make something wrong here because I don't do the tapping point. Um, I would comfortably say I think the tapping point is the more accurate position, but this could also be a more forward acquired centric where the patient could be helping you give centric. So like I said before, um, you have to use your clinical knowledge and say, hey, what is the right position? Yes, in theory, in books, it says two positions, but we all know um, there are patients that just won't give you that repeatable point. And um, to answer your question directly, for myself as a denturist, I put it at the point of the apex. Um, but for a lot of my denturist friends, there's Marcus Fisher in the audience there too. You can ask him that in the post. And uh, I will get back to you, uh, to be honest. And I will make sure that you guys have the right answer. Next question. Great, perfect. So the next question comes from Omar. And he's asking, are there specific intraoral scanners that you would recommend for new dentists? 
versus dentists who are more experienced? Okay, so that's a really, really difficult question, which could go on forever. And I'm going to make this really concise. Uh, just because an intraoral scanner is cheap doesn't mean it's not good. Um, Dr. Sumner and uh, Mian and uh, my friend Jason Hamilton in Calgary, Alberta are all steric masters. And uh, they prefer the steric way because they're very comfortable with that tool. If you are a young dentist, um, you really don't have a comfortable tool yet uh, because you don't really have the hands or you haven't touched um, this toolage and nor do you have the money to spend. Um, for myself, uh, I, I also don't have much money to spend. Uh, I'm a little biased, so I can't really touch on this topic uh, in a non-biased format. I like the i500 because it is an open source scanner, um, but that doesn't mean it's an easy scanner to use. So my point of the matter is as a young dentist, uh, we have access to the internet now, especially we have nothing to do. I have my nephew that's probably watching. Um, he's a young dentist uh, out in Newmarket, Ontario. Um, go online, check it out. And when you're all done, talk to these distributors uh, and ask them, hey, can I try that? You know, because if you, if, I'm sure they want to sell you that internal scanner too. And, and if you don't try it as a doctor, how do you know if you can use it? You can test drive those cars. Um, so that's my, my point is like, ask these distributors to let you test drive. Right. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Perfect. I think that answers it. So the third question then is from Saba. And the question is, are you printing interim partials in immediate cases as well as using the system? Okay. So that's a really important topic. So today I only showed the in-lab system and the in-lab system at this moment in time can produce only upper and lower uh, opposing arches. Yes, it's possible to do a upper opposing a natural dentition. Um, so in this aspect, this is a very good question that he asked, is you need to ask that before you purchase the software as a denturist or as a laboratory or as a clinician. Um, for myself, uh, in the current software I showed, no. Uh, in free shape and in ExtoCAD, the answer is yes. Uh, so the point of the matter is you could either mill or print the interim prosthetic, uh, acrylic prosthetic, uh, if you use the software that was capable of outputting a partial or interim prosthetic. So I would say ExoCAD or Three Shape would be your best bet. Uh, my friend Boyd Doucette is on the audience. He's a denturist in Saskatchewan. Would, um, Boyd Doucette, if you just message everyone and then uh, everyone can ask. Carson Law and Boyd Doucette are both different software users. So you can ask them on the chat and they'll reach out to you. They're really friendly. And that's something that you need to ask. So software-based. Great, awesome. So the last question then for you, Mark, comes from Liz. The question is, can you use the digital method to add teeth to existing dentures? And it's a two-part question. The second part here is, for the analog denture method, do you prefer when the dentist sends you a face bow or not? Okay, so that's a really important topic. Uh, when I worked at a lab, a lot of times um, in the analog way, uh, our dentist used to send us a face bow. And let's be totally honest, if you're a clinician and as a young dentist, Andrew, um, you know you hate, hate face bows, and that face bow gets bumped in the box on the way to the lab. A lot of times the lab's not going to use the face bow. They're just going to hand mount it on a flat table. So for a face bow, um, I would say as a young dentist, I would use a fox plane or a Kois facial analyzer, which is basically an over-glorified fox plane. That's what I would prefer because it is a flat plane that you determine as a clinician. In a worst case scenario, uh, if it all goes farted, um, the lab can mount it flat. Um, so that's for the fox plane method. So I use the Koi spatial analyzer for my fox plane and my Facebook transfer. The secondary part of the question, which was a repair, uh, can you repair? Uh, she was existing... asking, can you use the digital method to add teeth to existing dentures? Um, so the question is, yes, you can scan that section and add that section, but how do you bond that section back to the analog denture? Um, that's a little difficult and you're just kind of going back to analog. So I would say it's probably easier to do the repair for a denture in an analog way. However, uh, if you do have a chair side mill and you are a serif doctor and a patient breaks a tooth off a denture and you don't want to send it to a lab, you could prep the denture virtually, scan it with your intraoral scanner, tell the intraoral scanner that it is a tooth and you can mill it out of QMA, crown and bridge temporary material and bond the tooth there, chair side. So that's the way you could do that denture repair if it's a tooth pop off. Um, for myself, I use intraoral scanning and lab scanning to do repairs on uh, existing partials. So I scan an existing partial and I have to do a partial addition. I will add that section back in a cast mesh or an extension on a partial and I send it from my lab for casting and molding. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, no yeah, last minute question here. So why would you want to scan an impression rather than just take an intraoral scan? Two steps okay. versus one step. 
I kind of touched, I think Kate is probably a dentist. Um, yeah, like I said a before. New dentist like myself. Um, so the point is, is that an intraoral scanner can take the soft tissue record, but it can't take the record of the border. And as maybe she bumped in a little bit later in the lecture is that it, you cannot capture the functional border of a border mold and impression uh, that I can't uh, take as a clinician. So yes, an intraoral scanner can take a, a wide shot of the intraoral tissue, but it can't manage uh, tissue compression. It also cannot manage the uh, cheek and the border that you can manually dexterity uh, manipulate as a clinician. So um, to answer your question, that's why a lot of our clinicians that do dentures, uh, especially Carson Law out there, we scan our uh, analog uh, taken PBS because we can obtain the border. All right. Very good. Okay. I think that's all the questions. I'll pass it back to Dr. Shergan here to wrap up. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. Well done. Uh, we'd like to thank our co-hosts for the day, Dr. Mian, Drs. Mian Quek and Dr. Jeff Sumner. And once again, Andrew, uh, thank you so much for uh, helping us out too with the Q&A. And congratulations on, on graduating to you and the entire 2020 graduating class. So I know it was a, uh, you know, difficult times right now for you guys, a little bit unusual, but um, you know, we're doing this for you guys and I hope you guys have been enjoying the talks. Um, I would like to thank our speakers for the day. Um, uh, Mr. Adam McCabe and Mark Chan, of course, Chris from Swiss and Andreas from Panthera Dental as well. And I'm looking forward to having you guys join us tomorrow. So please have a safe day. Enjoy the beautiful weather out there. And we'll see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Have a great day, guys.